On today's episode of The Lost Record, we delve deep into the story of the Schwerer Gustav, its conception, its creation, and the unimaginable force it unleashed on the battlefields of Europe. During the uneasy years before the Second World War, Europe was a continent preparing for the worst while hoping for the best. Nations poured resources into fortifications, armor, and artillery, believing the next conflict would be decided by whoever could hold out the longest behind concrete and steel. Among these defenses stood the French Maginot Line, a vast underground wall meant to shield France from another German invasion. Its designers believed it could endure anything modern armament might unleash. Inside Germany, however, military planners viewed the Maginot Line as both a challenge and an opportunity. If they could create a weapon capable of breaching it even briefly, the psychological and strategic impact would be immense. That ambition eventually led to the birth of the largest artillery piece ever constructed, Schwerer Gustav. The weapon represented more than industrial strength. It reflected a doctrine shaped by the trauma of the previous war. Massive guns had once dominated the battlefield, and many German commanders still believed that overwhelming, concentrated firepower could shatter any fortress. When Krupp, the country's leading weapons manufacturer, accepted the task, its engineers entered uncharted territory. What emerged after years of design and testing was a machine that defied comparison, taller than buildings, longer than a passenger train, and powerful enough to send a seven-ton projectile across tens of kilometers. Schwerer Gustav pushed the boundaries of what human hands could create. Though conceived for one purpose, it was ultimately used for another. Its journey, from early drawings in Essen to its thunderous appearance in Crimea, reveals not only engineering ambition, but the shifting realities of a world at war. This is the story of a weapon unmatched in size, and the brief moment when it stood at the center of one of history's most brutal sieges. In the mid-1930s, European nations were defined as much by their memories as by their armies. The trauma of World War I had carved deep scars, and the French response took the form of the Maginot Line, an enormous defensive barrier of reinforced concrete and buried steel. It housed artillery, garrisons, observation posts, and supply corridors hidden beneath layers of earth and armor. German authorities understood the challenge this created. If war returned, a direct assault on the Maginot Line would be costly, slow, and uncertain. For planners in Berlin, the question became whether a weapon existed that could neutralize sections of the line quickly enough to open a breach? The answer, at that time, was no. Yet the absence of such a weapon made the idea even more compelling. When Krupp's engineers reviewed the army's requirements, the figures bordered on the unreal, a projectile capable of punching through meters of reinforced concrete, surviving immense acceleration forces, and traveling far beyond the range of conventional siege guns. To meet these demands, Krupp proposed a barrel larger and heavier than anything ever cast. The company had built heavy artillery artillery before, but nothing even remotely approaching the scale now required. The design process stretched across years. Engineers debated barrel length, recoil systems, loading mechanisms, and the specialized railway structure needed to support such weight. Metallurgists experimented with new alloys. Artillery experts calculated pressures previously considered unmanageable. Slowly, the concept emerged an 80-centimeter gun mounted on a reinforced twin-rail carriage. For German leadership, the project carried propaganda value even before completion. A weapon of unprecedented size suggested technological supremacy and national strength. Still, many officers questioned the practicality of constructing something so immense. It would be slow to deploy, vulnerable to air attack, and reliant on intact railways, conditions increasingly rare in modern war. Yet, for a time, the idea prevailed. The gun was approved, factories began forging its colossal components, and the impossible gradually took shape. Schwerer Gustav was not born solely from military necessity, but from an era convinced that monumental engineering could shape the fate of nations. The assembly of Schwerer Gustav demanded capabilities rarely attempted in peacetime and almost unheard of in wartime. In Essen, Krupp's industrial complex became a vast, relentless workshop devoted to constructing the largest cannon ever conceived. The barrel posed the greatest challenge. Stretching more than 30 meters, it required precision machining to maintain inner surfaces smooth enough to withstand enormous pressure. Any imperfection risked catastrophic failure. Forging a single piece of steel of such length required enormous furnaces and custom-built tools created specifically for this project. The result was a seamless tube capable of surviving stresses no previous artillery barrel had endured. 
Supporting the barrel were two immense steel chassis, each mounted on multiple rail bogies to distribute the gun's weight across parallel tracks. The system allowed for elevation adjustments, while horizontal aiming depended largely on the curvature of the rails themselves. Every component of the gun was oversized, bolts as thick as a man's arm, hydraulic absorbers weighing several tons, a breech block so heavy it required cranes merely to position it. Each piece could stand alone as a feat of heavy engineering, yet together they formed a weapon of astonishing scale. Ammunition was equally formidable. The shells, taller than ordinary soldiers, were built to survive the massive forces generated at firing. High explosive rounds carried hundreds of kilograms of explosives, while armor-piercing shells relied on their own immense weight and velocity to penetrate deep into fortifications. By completion, the gun weighed roughly 1,350 tons, too heavy for most bridges, too large for standard rail transport, and too valuable to risk in mobile combat. It required rail movement, on-site assembly, and a controlled environment to operate. Though its practicality remained questionable, Gustav represented a technological leap, a demonstration of what industrial power could achieve when unconstrained by cost or efficiency. It stood as proof that human ingenuity could be stretched far beyond traditional limits, whether doing so made sense on the battlefield or not. Schwerer Gustav was not merely a gun, it was an operation that moved like a small army. Deploying it required meticulous preparation, often beginning months before a single shot could be fired. The gun traveled in dozens of rail cars, some carrying barrel segments, others transporting carriage components, cranes, mobile workshops, communication gear, and security detachments. Upon arriving near the chosen firing position, workers began constructing the dual-track system needed to bear the weapon's immense weight. These tracks demanded reinforced foundations to prevent shifting under recoil. Assembly typically lasted between three and six weeks. Crews erected cranes, bolted the massive chassis together, aligned the twin tracks, and finally mounted the barrel. Every stage required exact precision. With components of such size, even small errors mattered. Supporting Gustav required more than engineers. Anti-aircraft batteries formed a defensive perimeter against reconnaissance and bombing raids. Supply units delivered food, fuel, ammunition, medical care, and spare parts. Communication teams linked the gun to observation posts positioned miles away, often dug into hillsides or hidden in captured structures. Firing procedures were equally demanding. Shells were hoisted from storage to the breach by gantries. Multiple powder charges were inserted behind each projectile their quantities calibrated to the required range and target type. Range officers calculated wind, temperature, humidity, and barrel wear, each capable of altering a shell's trajectory over long distances. The barrel was inspected after every shot. The immense pressures gradually eroded its inner lining, and engineers monitored this wear with great care. Replacing the barrel, when necessary, was an operation in itself. Such complexity limited Gustav to carefully prepared environments. It could not simply be moved from battle to battle. It required stability, time, space, and complete control of surrounding territory. For this reason, it was used in combat only once at Sevastopol, where conditions finally allowed such a colossal weapon to operate. When Germany advanced into the Soviet Union in 1941, the fighting quickly revealed the strength of the fortifications defending key Soviet positions. Among them, Sevastopol stood out as one of the most heavily fortified cities in the world. Built into cliffs and solid rock, reinforced with underground networks, and guarded by powerful coastal batteries, it posed a formidable challenge to the German 11th Army. High command determined that Sevastopol's defenses justified deploying Schwerer Gustav. Transporting the gun to Crimea required building new rail lines and extensive efforts to conceal its movement. Once assembled north of the city, Gustav occupied a specially excavated firing position that offered firm ground and a wide firing arc toward multiple Soviet strong points. In June 1942, Gustav began firing. Its shells targeted ammunition depots, fortified bunkers, and deeply buried installations. One of its most documented successes was the destruction of an underground Soviet ammunition magazine, an explosion so powerful that it shook the surrounding hills. The gun also participated in strikes against several key forts, hitting targets beyond the reach of most German artillery. Observation teams worked constantly to adjust fire and confirm impacts. Gustav's thunderous reports echoed across the peninsula, a reminder to both sides of 
the immense force being employed, yet, for all its dramatic presence, the gun's overall influence on the siege remained limited. Sevastopol ultimately fell to sustained infantry assaults, conventional artillery, dive bombing attacks, and the gradual exhaustion of Soviet supplies. Gustav contributed, particularly against hardened targets, but it did not decide the battle. After the city's capture, plans to redeploy the weapon elsewhere, including against Leningrad, soon faded. The front was too unstable, the logistical demands too great, and Allied air power increasingly dominant. The moment for such a weapon had passed almost as soon as it arrived. By the final stages of World War II, the principles of warfare had shifted decisively. Mobility, air power, and rapid deployment mattered far more than monumental siege guns. Weapons like Schwerer Gustav, once envisioned as war changers, had become symbols of an older military mindset. Key disadvantages of the gun quickly became apparent. Its operation required immense manpower and logistics. Approximately 2,000 to 2,500 personnel were needed for assembly, operation, and security, including several anti-aircraft battalions to provide protection. Transported in five main sections on a dedicated railway, assembly alone took four days. Its extreme immobility further limited effectiveness. As a railway gun, Gustav could only operate on specially constructed dual parallel tracks. Shifting its aim sideways required building a curved section of track and moving the entire gun along it, a slow, resource-intensive process. Coupled with its massive size, this made it highly vulnerable to air attack. Continuous air cover was essential, tying up significant Luftwaffe resources. The gun's operational limitations also reduced battlefield impact. Its rate of fire was extremely slow, typically around 14 rounds per day, while the barrel endured significant wear and had to be replaced after roughly 300 rounds. These replacements demanded additional time, industrial effort, and manpower. The development, manufacturing, and maintenance costs were enormous, draining both material and human resources for a weapon whose utility was limited. Finally, by the time Gustav was ready for action, warfare had evolved. Rapid, mobile blitzkrieg tactics had rendered static, ponderous superguns largely obsolete. Its original purpose, breaching the French Maginot Line, was unnecessary when German forces simply bypassed such fortifications. As Germany's front collapsed, the gun size became a liability rather than an asset. Both Gustav and its sister gun, Dora, were destroyed in 1945 to prevent capture. Yet, despite its flaws, Schwerer Gustav endures as a symbol of human engineering pushed to the extreme, a reminder of both ambition and limitation. It demonstrates that technological wonder alone cannot shape the outcome of war. Adaptability and strategy remain decisive. Its story, preserved in photographs, records, and witness accounts, serves as a testament to the lengths nations will go when fear, pride, and uncertainty collide.